Welcome to the podcast, Scattered, One Person's Search for the Story Behind Human Remains. My name is Yvonne Chorlin. I'm a physical anthropologist and archaeologist. In other words, I like dead people. In this podcast, I explore topics related to dead people, from searching for human remains in forensic contexts to mortuary practices in modern and archaeological contexts and everything in between. I offer information, perspectives, and insights directly from the mouths of researchers, as well as experiences of people who work with remains. All of this aims to provide you with information on subjects that aren't really talked about, don't seem to be a priority, or they can be very misunderstood. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome back. Hello, dear listener. It's nice to have you here. First, before we get into the interview, an update. Calgary and Alberta has had not a good summer. Oh boy, wildfires have taken out, I've heard, a third of the town of Jasper. For those of us who have Jasper deep in our hearts, this is just devastating news. And thoughts and wishes go out to those residents of Jasper. Also, Calgary is going to be experiencing the second water restriction of the summer because, you know, things aren't bad enough as it is. We have hopefully finished our heat wave for the summer. Um, Our first water restriction was because of a water main break at the beginning of June. That got fixed just before Stampede at the beginning of July. So it was a whole month without really water. Um, Very, very little just to kind of sustain life. And we're going to be heading back into that at the end of August. So yeah, for those of you listeners who are in Calgary, my heart goes out to all of us. It's been, it has been a tough summer. The summer's not done yet. For those of you who are not in Calgary and who have people who live in Calgary, Calgarians are probably going to be in a bad mood for, for September. Please give us <laughs> some... um love and uh, a wide berth. (laughs) A research update. Um, Last episode, you may have heard that I was about to do a mapping exercise with the RCMP. We did that at the end of July in plus 30 degrees Celsius weather. Oh yeah, it was glorious. (laughs) Um, What we did is I took some bones and I laid them out Outside in a an outdoor context as a sort of simulated scenario. And then the RCMP had a total station and a drone, which we used to do use which we used to employ surveying methods and photogrammetry to map the bones and place the scattered bones in a geo-referenced photo that can capture and provide contextual information about the environment in which the scatter is located. And the reason I wanted to do this is because my usual method is to just use a cloth tape and measure the bones. That isn't all that accurate or precise. As well, when I walk around and try to get a lay of the land, I usually don't go too far. So I may only walk maybe 50 to 100 meters around the scatter to get an idea of the environmental context. If there's topography or vegetation changes or something outside the area that I walk, I may not see that like a waterway or more game trails or a coyote den or something like that. I have no idea that it's there. However, if we can place, if we can use a drone to get an idea of what the environment is like, we might be able to pick up on these things and get a better sense of what may or may not be influencing the scavengers that scatter the bones. So we're still compiling the data on that. I'll let you know how things go. In other news, um, research, we're not, again, like I said before, we haven't put out any more um, pig carcasses to do more research. We're still kind of crunching the data on previous years, including a Saskatchewan study. So there were two sites uh, just north of Saskatoon, which were put out in 2022 and were collected in 2023. And so I'm making videos for those and crunching the data, and we're going to be writing up a small paper on, on those two sites as well. 
And then last not least, just because, you know, the summer couldn't be any more full, I'm going to be at the When Words Collide conference in Calgary uh, next weekend. So that is August 16th through 19th, I believe, if memory serves. Um, it's a conference for writers and readers. So if you are a reader who loves writing of any kind, it used to be a genre conference. So focus primarily on sci-fi fantasy. It's not like that anymore. Um, they welcome all sorts of writers and authors. Um, and yeah, so if you're a reader or a writer, come on down. I will be there selling my books and my art, and I'll also be moderating a panel. So I hope to see you there. If you're there, come up and say hi. Please, if you find this podcast and the information within it useful, I would love it. If you would consider supporting the podcast by donating, you can donate through Buy Me a Coffee or through Patreon. Buy Me a Coffee, you can donate through five or ten dollars or however much a five dollar coffee costs, and the money goes directly to me to support my time. You can also donate by becoming a Patreon member. You can be a Patreon member, a free member, you can also become a paid member. I'm just developing my Patreon site, so it's not as fleshed out and established as other Patreon community members, but I hope to provide some exclusive content there for paid members. I spend a lot of time reading journal articles and books to find interviewees, and I also spend quite a bit of money doing the research that you hear about on this podcast. All of the research that I do is voluntary and comes out of my own pocket. Um, I'm not an academic member, a faculty member anywhere, and I'm also not an adjunct member. I try to follow the academic rigor standards, but all of that costs time, money, and what have you. So donating through Buy Me a Coffee or through Patreon would really help me a lot. So if you enjoy this podcast and you feel that it's valuable and the research that I do is valuable, please consider buying me a coffee or becoming a Patreon member. Links are in the show notes and on my website, yvonnechorland.com. If you want to ask me a question, I would love to hear from you. You can reach me through my website at yvonnechorland.com, email me at ychorland at gmail.com, or contact me through my Facebook page, Reluctant Archaeologist, and through Instagram at yvonnechorland. You can also comment on this podcast through my website and on YouTube. Reach out and tell me what you think of the show and what you're learning about dead people. Now here is the interview. Um, because I always have a fear of, of saying somebody's name incorrectly, and that's just, that's just not nice. <laughs> so you know who you are. You know how to say your name. So please. Tell me who you are and, and what you do. Okay, my name is Patrick Church. I'm a funeral director and embalmer. I also have the privilege of serving as an instructor um, at Mount Royal University in uh, the funeral director embalming program. And my specific uh, area of expertise is embalming theory. Wow, I... I am just tickled that you are, I could get you on a podcast because I've always had an interest in embalming. And okay. um, I actually tried to get um, a job, an apprenticeship um, way back when, like 20 years ago, um, when I was fresh out of grad school. But everybody wanted me to do the funeral services part, the, the sort of sales end of things. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't do well with the living. I want to work with the dead. But they, they didn't seem to want that. They wanted me at the front end doing sales. And so it didn't work out. <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. Loss to the industry. Oh, you're very sweet. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about how you found yourself in funeral services, because I find that that's always a very interesting journey for people. So tell us about your journey. So one of the uh, things that I have been told versus my experience. Um, so I don't remember ever uh, making the comment 
Um, but my sister very clearly does. Uh, I told her at the close, I believe it was somewhere about 86 of uh, my dad's aunt's funeral that I could, I could do this job. We're in the funeral home and I just, I just reflected to her that it's a job that I could do. Uh, I don't remember that. Um, now in university, I had a colleague who uh, she firmly believed that I would make an excellent funeral director, that I just had all the classic, the classic uh, pieces looked good in black. I would stand demurely to the side and to the back and would not be obtrusive in in family's experiences. and That's very um, interesting that you had these people around you just volunteering this information that, hey, Patrick, you should try our funeral services. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it, 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 when I was younger, I always thought, you know, maybe law. Um, but the further I went in university and uh, as I was doing master's work, less less interested in uh, in in school and in, in in that sort of eventual outcome, and so I began knocking on funeral home doors, and somewhat probably similar to yourself, I I was met with the wall, and that wall was very much. You don't have experience. We hire people with experience. Well, how'd you get experience? You have to be hired, right? So this weird catch <laughs> twenty two, right? I am familiar with that one. Yeah, and so I, uh, I I knocked on doors, and you know, when I was younger, I was probably a shyer kid, um, so I didn't I didn't push or sell myself maybe in the ways that I should have. Um, so I, I went into what I knew and was comfortable with, and I started working with databases and nonprofits and, uh, did a lot of, uh, did a lot of work, uh, in that field until I had to eventually further my education. And so I'm at a crossroads. I have to go back to school. Um, am I doing something that I really want to be doing? Uh, and if I really want to be doing this, how do I come to do it? And so I determined that I would probably end up going to university in the U.S. and a place like either San Francisco or Los Angeles or Cincinnati, um, where there were more open programs. And the year that I had made that determination, uh, the Alberta Funeral Service Association gave me a call and said that the program in uh, Alberta was changing and they would like me to be part of the first class. And so all of a sudden, sure, it was there for me and I, I did not have to leave and uh, incur a lot of expenses by, by going south of the border. And I'm so just here amazed I am. that that you, I mean, if, if anybody else would, were to go up, you know, to have somebody, a friend, family member, come up to them and say, hey, you should check out a career in, in funeral services. I mean, that would probably shock some people to receive that sort of feedback. Like, what on earth makes you think that I would fit in funeral services other than, you know, looking good in black? Like, because you're you're dealing with well, number one, the dead. Not everybody can do that, and not everybody wants to do that. And you're also dealing with this whole mountain of emotions that people, the living, go through when dealing with their deceased loved ones. That is not for everyone. So, for you to one take that be receptive to that feedback and then two to actually do something with that feedback that just that amazes me well there is there was and there still remains nothing about the work that uh would intimidate me okay um now 
Uh, does that mean I, I would have no learning curves? Most certainly not. Um, in terms of the decedent, nothing about the body is is so massively overwhelming for me. Um, now I grew up on a farm. I, you know, you'd always have, you know, the death of animals around you, um, not on a going basis, but on a uh, on those one offs, right, with cattle mm -hmm. and where. Uh, you know, animals going to to slaughter, animals dying naturally, you were engaging with that. Um, so nothing about the body would sort of throw any any significant disruption to my world. I knew that. Um, being with people is something that uh, like I said, I was shy when I was a kid, and you're totally right. Uh, the funeral industry demands that you have to be pretty much front and center, and you're dealing with people one-on-one -on -one and at a very horrible and weird time for them. And uh, you have to somehow be committed to being there with them. And I think that is something that I have grown into most certainly, um, but something I very much enjoy. I enjoy uh, people's stories. I enjoy uh, chatting with people and learning about people and knowing people's journeys as much as I can in the short time that I am with them. Okay. I, I've heard that before from from others that either living or, or on or, or working on a farm, it exposes you to, I guess, the cycle of life. It, it's not, you know, the, the typical city experience where you're very divorced and disconnected from that. You're, you're immersed in it and it gives you a whole different appreciation for, for what goes on in the world. Yeah, I would, I would concur. Yeah. So would you say then that um, with that very early feedback that you would, you may consider a, a career in funeral services, would that kind of been a, a plan B? Or was that just something that was kind of always in the back of your mind? I don't know if I had a plan, Yvonne. That's the problem <laughs> with myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like I said, fair enough. <laughs> I was inter I was interested in law, um, but not interested enough ultimately to pursue it when it came time and I had the opportunity to uh, uh, do graduate work. Was, was it a direction I was going to go? No, it wasn't. Um, it did not hold my attention through university. So I, I guess I fell into it rather than necessarily having a uh, a firm plan. Okay, so, so what did you do your yeah. master's in? Uh, philosophy, religious studies. Oh, I studied wow. uh, uh, a Jesuit uh, uh, theologian by the name of Bernard Lonergan. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He wow. was an interesting that voice in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, uh, in parallel with, with sort of what was going on at the same time in Europe, it was an interesting character, interesting thought. Okay, but yet you found yourself um, working in IT and databases for nonprofits after all of yeah. that. Totally fell into it. Yes, my dad was <laughs> a very, my dad was a very early advocate of uh, of uh, of computers. We had like a very early Apple Apple system. Um, back in the early 80s, late 70s, somewhere in there, he, he began. And wow. uh, yeah, so I grew up with them. And they were easy for me to work with and to uh, play with. Huh. And even in the 90s, it wasn't necessarily easy and familiar for everyone. Right. So yeah. When I came out of school in 96, it was 
okay, where am I? And when the door knocking didn't pan out, nonprofit databases did, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So um, things changed in the funeral service industry. Um, you mentioned this, this cycle of, you know, nobody's going to hire you without experience. And the only way you can get experience is being hired, um, which I'm sure that, you know, not just me, there are some other people out there that can really relate to that. <laughs> um, so, but at that time you said the funeral service um, education system had changed. Tell us about that. So historically, the, uh, the system used to be uh, very much controlled by the industry. The, uh, you would be working in the funeral home, and after the funeral home had the time to evaluate and determine whether you would be a good long-term fit um, in the industry and probably within their specific funeral home, then uh, they would sponsor you into uh, an education program. So it kind and, of was like an apprenticeship or an internship. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, very much so. And then, yeah, it, th that that changed. It, the industry realized that maybe that wasn't the best way of, of working, or at least okay. the school system that we had at the time. All right. Yeah, it was very, I mean, from my experience, which is 20 years ago, which may have been around about that time of this education change, um, I grew up with the stories of, you know, my dad came from a farming community, small town, and he would say he went to school with somebody who was apprenticing through their hometown funeral home. And so that's what kind of stuck in my mind that, hey, that's how you do it. So let's go out. And I started knocking on doors too, which is where I met with the whole, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you need experience, but we, can, we're, we can't hire you and you would be better off to do the, the sales portion rather than the embalming portion, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that's a bit of a catch 22, definitely. But things changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were able to go. And, and get your education. Yes, yes, which is fantastic. I, I was, I was going to. One way or another, um, it just it it. Just really worked out, to my advantage that, uh, Mount Royal, offered, the program on behalf of the Funeral Service Association in Alberta that I didn't have to travel, and go someplace else. Okay. So, and how long did it take you to do the program? Were you doing it full time, part time? Uh, it was it was full time. It right. was a uh, so it it still remains. You have a certain number of hours, um, apprenticeship hours that you have to practical hours that you have to secure following your uh, schooling. Okay. Uh, the the schooling. Um, for myself in the first year was was a a full a full year of classes um, rather than spread out. So some programs will rather than doing a spring and summer will do just fall and winter back two years. And Mount Royal did the uh, did the uh, spring and summer instead of doing the two year. So um, it made it more appealing to, uh, to go that, that route as well. The uh, hours after, I forget the number at this point, um, but it was essentially a full year of work that you had to uh, engage with. And that would be at a funeral home, correct? Yeah, and you would be okay. submitting submitting various types of reports um, that would uh, be part of the regulatory body's evaluation of uh, granting you a license. So you'd have your education component. So the college would submit that you have done your education, now university. Um, the uh, You would have to submit 
uh, hours that that someone within the funeral home would attest that you have completed these hours. You would have to uh, submit uh, records of certain activities, specifically uh, embalmings and arrangements. Um, so sitting with families and and sitting with the deceased. All right. And so, so you come. Sorry. So, pretty much a, a year of classes, and then a, a year of um, placement in a home. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then the regulatory board receives all these uh, all these attestations and and grants license after you write your board exams. So that is the final piece: is the board exams. And and so, are you typically? Um, learning and board certified in both the funeral services and embalming both at the same time you can be separate okay. um, now when i went through the program you could not be you had to do both pieces you had to become an embalmer and a funeral director okay um, you could not separate them out the license was not uh, a separate license um, that changed in the the somewhere in the early two thousands, and they began creating funeral director only licenses and bomber only licenses, so that uh, those who who wanted to focus in specific areas could focus in those areas. All right. Okay. So we've already kind of touched on at least a, a little bit of the evolution of funeral services, at least the education portion of it um, in the past 20 years that things have changed, but funerals in general have, have a bit of history. And I know you, 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 it sounds like you just, you really get into the history of this. And, and so I, I'd like you to, to take us through kind of how Funeral services have evolved. Um, I know that embalming, um, it, at least in Alberta, and I don't know about Canada, but it's not a requirement. And a lot of people don't know that and that it's not always been around. And so I'd like you to take us through, you know, kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of some of the history. How did, why do we... How did we come up to this? You know, why do we have funeral homes and, and why do we have burials and which are now, you know, there's more of a, a shift to, to cremation nowadays. And, you know, why, why do we embalm when we didn't always used to embalm? Stuff like that. Yeah, the history of our industry is quite fascinating. When we look at, I think, the deeper history that we have with death, we find it's probably something that's very familial, something that's very much centered in small community within a family home. And if it's not happening within a family home, it's happening very close to our community. The deceased is probably brought to the home or a central community space the deceased would be sat with. They'd be watched over. Communities would bring religious and ritual elements to death. Dressing of bodies and putting flowers with bodies. Other, other meaningful tokens and elements. Before ultimately uh, a body would be taken for uh, disposition whether that be at a, at a burial at a cemetery, a community's little cemetery, or whether that be a community's uh, point of cremation. So this would have been, I think, the experience most people would have had with death for millennia. It would be something that is, is happening very much uh, within a very small community structure. And as I mentioned, we would have begun practicing ritual elements around death as we see the rise of 
of religious institutions, they would then begin to serve in a uh, in a means between uh, uh, the home and that final disposition of interment um, or cremation. We would see uh, with the rise of churches that we would then bring our loved one into those religious spaces for ultimate uh, uh, service and interment. When we are seeing the development of uh, our uh, large religious institutions, we're seeing ultimately the growth of community. And as communities grow, that brings problems to uh, death remaining something situated in the home and in the small community. So, for example, when communities grow and we begin to experience plague years within large urban settings, communities' response is to move death outside of the urban center to the edge. And so we begin to see cemeteries uh, not being community cemeteries, but being uh, large urban cemeteries located at the edge of uh, urban dwellings. That brings, of course, a level of sort of distance and bureaucracy to death. We uh, will see uh, larger institutions, for example, hospitals, prisons. Those people are going to, uh, when death is experienced in those institutions, be, be buried uh, in relationship to those institutions. So they will have burial grounds attached to those institutions. So again, death is moved away from our community. Or when we see uh, people going off to war, bodies are going to be buried where they fall. There is no repatriation of death historically. There is no bringing our loved ones home. When we die in, in battle, we are buried at the battlefield. So as communities grow and we experience these growth challenges, death is moved further away from that central space that would have been uh, the family, the family home in our very small community. Of course, Another factor is when we have the growth of communities, we also have the growth of communal living. We don't necessarily have our own living space. We're in shared spaces. And it's, it's, not, it's not fundamentally uh, feasible to bring our loved one into a shared space. And so instead we have um, then the places like churches, like our religious institutions, being able to step in and being able to accommodate and host our experience and our relationship to the, the deceased. So we have this movement outwards from the home. Now, things are happening in Europe and things are happening in North America. And I want to reflect first on North America uh, because something uh, quite unique happens, and that is the U.S. Civil War. The U.S. Civil War brings together um, horrible, horrible, bloody battlefields where surgeons, where doctors are needed to address um, uh, the wounded. Um, these doctors, though, have gone through university where they had to train and their training involved the preservation of deceased bodies for their study purposes. So doctors knew how to preserve bodies, how to embalm. So while embalming happened infrequently prior to this, 
very infrequently, all of a sudden the U.S. Civil War offered something that we had never seen before. And that is the opportunity to bring our loved ones back from where they died. We could repatriate them. And so we had doctors undertaking this work and serving as embalmers during the U.S. Civil War and coming out of the war, offering those services to their communities. And so we see the rise in North America of embalming in the uh, following the, the U.S. Civil War in the late 1800s. And with this brought a number of just very pragmatic pieces. So if you are embalming someone, and if you are going to help arrange for someone to, to be taken someplace, you're also going to need uh, some sort of transportation receptacle, a casket or a coffin to do that. And so these folks then were able to um, then sell these pieces of merchandise. Now, that's fairly niche and does not necessarily provide a, uh, a living. So, you know, you're working with wood to build a casket for people. Maybe you could work with wood and, and have furniture. So our industry has this very close relationship to uh, furniture stores because lots of funeral homes were related to funeral stores, uh, furniture stores in their very early existence. And so we in North America now see in the 1800s, of course, the rise of, uh, again, those dense urban living situations and uh, apartment dwelling, again, that's not feasible to bring our deceased into those spaces. And so the, again, most pragmatic space to bring our deceased to would be um, the embalmer's home. So embalmer's homes began to have parlors for families to be with their loved ones. So we begin to see these uh, early, early vestiges of our community uh, uh, funeral homes as, as, uh, as people are wont to do while we have this relationship to uh, bringing our loved one to, uh, to church or to our religious institutions people don't always stay with their religious institutions. Um, the curious thing about uh, uh, Western Europe is, of course, the Protestant Reformation and the leaving of, of institution to create one's own religious practice and paradigm. And once that is something that is ingrained, you can't really uh, reverse that course. And so people vote with their feet and they, they leave their institutions if their institutions are not speaking to them. And so you have this uh, in the, and I'm sure throughout all of, all of time, a leaving of uh, our religious institutions. So in the 1800s, the early 1900s, continuing to today, as people uh, drift away from those spaces, then it's not appropriate to bring our loved ones into those spaces. And so we have the development of the creation of chapels associated with uh, the embalmer's funeral parlor. And you will see many historical funeral homes that are anchored by a house that was the embalmer or funeral director, the mortician's residence. And of course, as uh, those spaces um, 
continually over time grow or get outgrowing, then we see the more modern funeral home that is those those chapel, those service spaces, those visitation spaces, an office space rather than rather than being tied to a residence. They are uh, much more um, funeral homes as we experience them probably today by the vast majority of folks. So we have this trend in North America um, of bringing the deceased to, to the funeral home. And we have then uh, the... Uh, the creation of these um, these service spaces. Now, in Europe, we have something curious happening, and that is through the eighteen uh, hundreds. You have uh, the development of crematoria, and people working on the establishment of cremation spaces. And while cremation slowly develops in Europe, um, similar to here, it does not it does not uh, take off. But you have this you have this different experience in Europe where you have um, crematoriums functioning to offer disposition, and um, you also have something that we don't have here in North America with cemeteries, and that is. Um, cemeteries being uh, reclaimed, where uh, graves are only used temporarily. And after a certain period of time, uh, the bones of the deceased are taken from the grave so that the grave space can be reused. And then bones are placed into uh, either charnel houses or some other large receptacle um, where uh, where the bones are stored on mass, and so uh, Europe has this very different experience with with uh, with their uh, cemeteries and with their relationship to disposition that we don't have in North America, but they had this focus on um, the creation of crematoriums. And so crematoriums come to North America, and we'll begin to see them in the 1950s, but we don't really begin probably to see their impact probably into the 80s. And it's in the 80s and uh, 90s that cremation really changes uh, the landscape for funeral, uh, the funeral profession. And for the industry, um, all of a sudden you have this uh, this this process that um, again, uh, well, death moved from our our very familial community space, ultimately into the space of a funeral home. Now, cremation allows it to move out of that space again. So our, our funeral homes, while they originally, those early chapels modeled, uh, the modeled churches with chairs focused towards a, uh, a, a, a pulpit or a podium where the casket would be at the front, just like an altar would be at the front. Um, and often at funerals, we see that replicated, so very much church-like structures. Um, funeral homes in their very modern iteration have become rather uh, than, than uh, being sort of set, have become more multi-purpose spaces to be able to accommodate uh, very shifting needs of uh client families and consumers. And so that is a little bit where we are at and why we are at uh, the funeral homes and the, the spaces and the practices that we are at now.
Because it, so it that, sounds like from what you're describing that being with the dead is very much a, a community uh, activity, you know, whether it's, it's to support um, the grieving of, of the family or to, you know, just the community coming together to, to help out the, who, the living who, who remains. And, and the, the community, the focus of the community um, for a long time has been the church. I mean, you look at the layout of, of small towns, even now, I mean, we're, we're starting to get away from it, but small towns across North America and, and even in Europe, if you look at the layout of, of a small town, usually the church is the center of the town and that represents the center of the community. And that's where people went to see their neighbors. You know, you saw your neighbors once a week, you got the local gossip and, you know, you had some tea and then you went home and, you know, wash, rinse, repeat again next week. And, and so it sounds like from what you're saying that when the population started to get such that the church couldn't house those community functions where it, the, the funeral or the grieving process couldn't be done just in the home, they had to find another space, another bigger space to have those community functions. But at the same time, people started to disconnect from organized religion and to disconnect from the church. And so maybe people didn't want to go to a church to do those community functions, but wanted someplace a little bit more agnostic or you know, non-affiliated. And so it, it sounds like um, there's been in the funeral industry, um, yes, a little bit of uh, industrialization <laughs> mm -hmm. and then also um, evolution to meet different people's needs at different times. Very much so. Well, the church speaks to, to what people are going through. It speaks and talks about, about death, right? It's a, it's, it's a big part of, of people's, uh, people's Absolutely. lives yeah. and a big part of uh, what, what gives meaning and what what uh, uh, has uh, what 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 has come to them in in the the person of their loved one, and what has has uh, all of a sudden been taken from them um, by this by this event. So the church historically it's it's part of their their narrative part of their uh conversation with with their congregants so it makes sense that people would want to be there for that experience um of loss now uh uh not being a church person other than in name uh the uh uh I, I, it makes sense that it doesn't necessarily uh, speak to speak to everyone. So I can appreciate uh, why you would get that shift from from the need to be in church, the need to be in that space, the need to contextualize your loved one within that within that setting. Right. I also understand that, that people still have that need to contextualize their loved one within that setting too. Um, but if that setting and uh, what, what it's offering isn't, doesn't speak to folks, then why, why go into that space? So here's an interesting piece. In, early in my career, um, you would have families who, you know, don't want that, don't want religion, don't want the church stuff as part of their service. Um, yet who do we turn to as, as funeral directors? We were turning to, we were turning to clergy and we were turning to uh, more liberal branches of the church and saying, hey, can you, can you help this family by not really being a clergy person? And I always thought that, that was a little bit disingenuous of 
uh, not only uh, ourselves as funeral directors, but um, for the position that we were uh, asking clergy to to step into in dealing with families. Now, some families don't mind some of the touchstones of faith, some of the prayers, um, some of the structure, but some families wanted very little to nothing of that. And yet we would still turn to these folks. Now, very fortunately, at the same time, we've seen the development of uh, celebrants, non-denominational folks, uh, people who are um, serving as chaplains in hospitals and hospices who who don't have uh, that uh, that solitary commitment to uh, one church institution um, that they have to sort of somehow try and step away from or take out of their meaningfulness at that moment. Uh, instead, we have people who have the ability to to craft services that um, provide sort of ritual structure for families who who don't want those religious components. So, uh, that a good development in 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 my opinion, um, because it was always hard to ask a clergy person to not be a clergy person. Um, well, it's hard to ask effect. anybody not to be who they are. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we, we've seen the, the evolution, um, I guess, of, of funeral services away from, or at, at least uh, maybe less integration with with faith, religion, and the church into something non-affiliated. And um, but we've also seen an evolution away from burial, from embalming. Tell oh, us yes. a little bit about that. The the evolution from? Yeah. Because um, we, we've yeah. seen a lot more um cremation, green burials. That is very true. Uh now, our chemicals are purposeful. Um, we do need to employ them when we are, for example, if someone is making a repatriation journey to another country or to another location, um, they are required by international shipping regulations. They also allow us time. Uh, everybody will go through uh, unique and individual changes, um, and embalming buys time uh, for families to be able to plan and to gather and uh, be together. A very important piece, as you uh, see the the movement westward, and people need to to travel. They are no longer in their home communities. So they need to be able to come back and uh, historically travel, not being necessarily the easiest process. Um, embalming did allow for that time. Now, do we need to embalm everybody today? Most certainly not. And I would argue that the vast majority of bodies are not embalmed and uh, do not bring um, those those chemicals to their disposition, uh, largely because most bodies are being cremated, and that disposition is happening relatively quite quickly. However, embalming and the use of those chemicals does have a purpose. Now, the other piece is that the cemeteries have regulations around how bodies are buried within those spaces. And those regulations will account for um, the uh, ultimately the, the presence of those chemicals within uh, the environment of the cemetery space. And I think a final point to bring to this is really those chemicals aren't used in concentration. 
they are very much used in diluted uh, fashion. Um, a little bit of those chemicals goes a very long way in uh, doing its preservative work. So while uh, they are they are used, it is um, they are used uh, minimally, and I think by the industry cautiously, and I think ultimately by uh, by environmental agencies and regulations um, securely. Because it sounds like that there are um, common practices in the funeral industry, like burial, like embalming, and then there are regulations. And the two may not necessarily be the same, like burial and embalming may not be a requirement. It's more of a, a standard of, of practice. Whereas vaulting, depending on where you are, may be a requirement. Yes. All right. Yes. Well, burial is sort of a requirement if we just couldn't keep a decedent at home, for example. Um, I, I think um, most uh, communities, most jurisdictions, most provinces who would be governing health uh, legislations um, wouldn't allow for a body to be any other place other than medical research or buried within the confines of a cemetery. Um, now that doesn't include cremated remains, um, but I don't think we could just keep bodies at, at home. Um, we would have to find cemetery space for them. So we technically do have to bury bodies if we are not going to look at something like cremation or acclimation or um, or body donation to uh, medical research, for example. Right, because so there um, is maybe... then the requirement to bury within the confines of a cemetery. Right, but okay. creating a cemetery is very complicated. I can not well imagine. Can create a cemetery. <laughs> So how do you create green burial when you don't have that option to create a cemetery? You depend upon existing cemeteries to create green burial for you, but they then have to uh, have profound insight and practice. And they're also governed by legislations that, that determine how deep you need to bury bodies. Well, the most excellent green burial happens in shallow grave, not in not in deep graves with with four feet of earth. Uh, microbial activity just doesn't happen as efficiently and effectively at that depth. So um, when that's all regulated, um, it becomes hard to, to look at anything else in a substantive way. We get locked into our own perspectives. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because so really what this see, all yes. boils down to is just the, the pragmatics of it, that we need to dispose of this this body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And all the reg all the regulations around around. So, for example, um, I believe Saskatchewan has uh, an alkaline hydrolysis acclimation where the body is cremated through, through waters and lies. Um, and there are, uh, the province of Ontario, I believe has put a stop to further, uh, further development. So two came in um, and started, and then the province sort of, we haven't done enough environmental research and uh, totally stopped. Um, communities have gone into big fights over crematoriums coming into their spaces, um, even though uh, municipalities have zoning for crematoriums to operate, and they operate relatively uh, efficiently. 
um, without any affluent or odor or anything that people are scared of um, when they think about being next to a crematorium. Uh, yet communities have thrown up roadblocks to uh, the establishment of uh, uh, crematoriums within within zoning. So simple body disposal, because that's what it is, burial and cremation are two two primary means of it, are, are hard to hard to 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 manage and negotiate around um, can be really hard to manage and negotiate around, unfortunately. Right. I find that very interesting. So I understand you know, cremation. I mean, it uses a, a lot of energy to burn mm -hmm. a body, but then there's also, you know, the burn off. And it's a lot of carbon and stuff putting into the atmosphere. But at the same time, burial usually involves formaldehyde and all those lovely embalming chemicals, which can then leach into the soil. <laughs> and the environment. <laughs> that is that is uh, very true. Um, you now formaldehyde itself um, is, uh, you know, it, it, it it's yeah. Isn't the you know none of none of I guess the embalming chemicals or the the uh, the greatest chemicals to be. Uh, to be exposing ourselves to at the end of the day, um, but they are they they, they are purposeful. Um, they do have a they do have a purpose. Um, you think about folks who need to be transported overseas. Um, lots of factors can affect affect. Um, affect the sort of the, the, the need for them. Um, our bodies bring lots of challenges to being able to be well for services. Um, time and our ability to uh, uh, ensure good holding of bodies. Um, do, does everybody have to be embalmed? Probably not. Um, that is embalmed. Um, so, uh, but it is a tradition that uh, lots of folks, lots of folks follow. And, so with uh, all these new, um, I guess, options available now, green burial and composting where do you see funeral services you know and maybe even the continued um disconnection with faith and and faith-based um practices and rituals where do you see funeral services in the next 10 to 20 years oh Oh, to have a magic ball, right? To right. Have, uh, <laughs> they've, they've done a, an a amazing job over, glass. you know, even just 50, 60, 100 years of, of adapting to what people want, to their needs. Well, the, uh, the, the big adaptation that, that really came at the industry was cremation. Right. Um, that was, that really forced the industry to um, re- Refigure its relationship to um, itself somewhat. Uh, so you have traditionally, when you do a burial, you have caskets and you have funeral coaches. You have all these equipments that you have to engage with. You have all these um, these revenue streams that that you have coming to you. Um, when you have cremation taking over, um, you lose those revenue streams. And so the industry had to begin compensating. Not that the funeral industry is all about money. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit uh, about 
it beyond that. Um, but you had to compensate for 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 lost revenue. And so you um, you you have unfortunate uh, unfortunate pieces um, arise where people would would uh, sell um, hard to to families. Um, you have um, uh, uh, and would try and upsell on cremation containers and because we have to put bodies in something when we cremate them. Um, they can't just go, we have to be able to move them into the confined space of a uh, cremation chamber. So they have to be in something every jurisdiction broadly defines it as rigid, combustible, and enclosed. So you have very simple, um, at, at minimum, cardboard. But cardboard doesn't work for everyone because it's not rigid for certain bodies. And so you then have... Um, uh, let's move away from cardboard into, uh, you know, your your particle boards, and then you would have people who would push push more elaborate containers, and try and sell more elaborate containers um, on a regular basis. And so you you got uh, uh, a disingenuous feeling um, created somewhat towards. Uh, the industry, um, probably fairly, fairly so. Um, uh, people had a bad impression, I think, through uh, for many years of the industry in relationship to uh, being sales focused. And I think that was in terms of a compensation for that, uh, those shifting lost revenues when it came to, uh, came to, uh, cremation. Now, we are also seeing, though, a rise in um, celebration of life services that are more focused simply on visitation, sort of reception pieces, and not focused on sitting in a chapel, sitting focused at a podium, or focused at a table with an urn. Not that those pieces aren't part of those celebrations, not that the deceased isn't brought into those celebrations, um, that urns are present, but the, the focus is, is for lots of folks shifting away from that, that need to be in a chapel, um, need to be in that, that space. Um, so I think that is going to be an ongoing trend um, that, that will, will probably bring more challenges to the industry. Um, because at the, at the same time as, as that rises, do you need the funeral home anymore? Just like with cremation, you don't, need, you don't need the funeral home. You have an urn, you can take that wherever you want to take it and do uh, whatever you need to do with it. Um, the same when you do those celebrations of life and not those chapel services. You don't need that space to be able to, uh, to, to sit anymore. You, well, maybe the funeral home has a reception space. We can use that. But lots of places have reception spaces that you can bring stuff in and put things around for people to look at, that you can play videos, that you can you know, pause at some point and offer a toast or a few words. Um, you know, the legions, think of small town legions. Think of bars, right? Depending upon the type of people, golf courses, golf clubs. Um, so there's all these places where um, funeral services shift to when you don't have to have that um, focused chapel space and you just want to be doing a celebration of life party, go to a funeral and, and ask people about what they want. Um, I'm, I'm in the industry, so I hear, hear it all the time. 
about what people want, but the people who are most vocal about what they want um, don't want don't want funerals. Um, what so, is it about the funeral that they don't want? Is it the the faith? Is it um, the the somberness? Is it the, the the chapel? What is it about the funeral they don't want? I think it's a little bit of all of those pieces, right? Um, so for some people, there is the you know the 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 drive away from the 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 uh, seeing the deceased and being with the body is uh, about experiences of seeing someone uh, quote unquote put together uh, poorly, right? Their cosmetic work was wrong, their hair was wrong, the things weren't done well. And so they have a, a, a just a poor last moment experience with this person. So those are still common stories. Okay. Um, there is there is that piece there is the uh i think the uh the 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 somber the solemnness of the chapel um i think there is probably underlying it sometimes the uh the 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 costing of it all in in people's minds um uh because the generation that we're now largely serving is is we're at the baby boomers right we're just at the the end of those who were born before world war uh two so we're at people who were born in the 30s late 30s 40s early 40s um and we're coming into the baby boomers who um just the 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 priorities of of uh of that don't really don't really mesh that well for them, I suppose. Um, and I think it's a little bit of all those pieces you identified. All right. So it'll be up to the industry, the funeral industry, to see how they're going to continue to adapt to the rising cost of funerals, to the, I guess, the the increased demand of walking away from the somberness, from from faith, from chapels, but into what? That's, I guess, the question that's going to be up to the industry to figure out. The uh, So I think there's a whole bunch of positive pieces. Um, and that is like, you know, uh, the industry has uh, learned how to create ritual and offer meaningful ritual to, to families um, more than they probably ever have. Um, uh, offering fantastic and creative uh, types of services uh, to really help uh, be with families to, because we're, we're starting something very profound um, when we, we, we go through a service. Um, people are on a long journey after someone dies. Um, uh, that 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 grief journey is not is not uh, is not quick. Um, uh, it's not to be underestimated. It's not to be um, uh, thought of lightly. Um, it is a uh, and when I sit with families, I I can't I can't tell you and emphasize how. Uh, uh, precious that opportunity is because I get to hear um, their their story about their loved one, their love, the loss of their loved one. I get to be one of the first people who hear it. And it's a story they're going to craft over months and years. That story is going to change and shift with with grief but i get to be one of the first people who gets to hear that and um so uh the uh the ability to i think be present to um the that that sort of uh integral relationship with families has never been i think uh as well appreciated 
um, the, uh, the the relationship that we have to grief work um, is, I think, uh, wholly remarkable at this point. Um, funeral homes are doing uh, fantastic work with their communities, with their families, in that that post uh, that that post loss that post loss period, um, and people are taking much advantage of that. Um, I I I've never understood it, but I suppose it is correct. Um, I, uh, I I I. Uh, we had a homeless man the other day at uh, at the funeral home, and uh, he just wanted to charge his phone. And so he was having a coffee and uh, charging his phone. And then he asked for a ride downtown, and so I uh, or money for a ride. And I said, "Well, I have a vehicle. Why don't I give you a ride?" And uh, as we were on the journey, he asked me the question about my relationship with my death. Right? Like, how am I? Like, what is my thoughts around? Uh, my my own mortality, and I, I I've never really understood that we're a death denying culture, um, or if I really understand what that means. Um, but I think, uh, uh, you know, the work we are doing is probably reflected in the fact that people have a difficult. Uh, broadly, a very difficult time with uh, with loss. So we must be in some way somewhat of a death-defying <laughs> culture, um, because uh, funeral homes that are doing the work with with grief and uh, outreach within their communities. Um, there, there is just such fantastic need for it. Like people are really taking them up on, on, on that work, uh, which is which is excellent. And funeral homes are are really taking up that uh, that clarion cry. Uh, there's other pieces I think that are uh, are are great, and that is with uh, or going to show, I think, profound development in that is probably um, as uh, we do that work, um, we have a, a shift within in the culture of, you know, we have death doulas, we have, uh, uh, you know, the entire caregiving community, the pre-death caregiving community that uh, just needs support. And I think the profession is uh, learning to uh, appreciate and reach out to those communities and those folks who really are uh, in in uh, in uh, I don't want to say crisis mode, but I I would think are in uh, uh, you know overwork mode for sure. So the industry is really looking at um, needs of the community in uh, very broad ways um, that sort of go outside of those those traditional pieces that um, when we think about funeral industry, we think about, uh, so I have to get a cemetery plot, I have to be cremated, I need an urn, I need a casket, right? That uh, yeah, those are those are pieces of it, but there's uh, much more integral pieces um, before us, and so I, I think the the industry is is uh, moving well in that direction to uh, to be with families and to be with the community on those fronts, um, and to help lead where uh, those uh, those places uh need right absolutely is that affecting ultimately funeral service and those pieces that uh are more imperative to your podcasting conversation about about the the deceased i'm not sure that it is um but i don't think in 10 years i'm going to see green burial shift 
around me. Um, I, uh, I would think that uh, there's lots of great opportunities for it. Um, but I think it's like, it's, it's overcoming legislation, it's overcoming lots of pieces, and I'd really like to see it. Um, uh, now, it's growing, I think, south of the border, and it's growing in, in uh, communities on the, on, on the west coast, and um, there's some interesting uh, uh, changes, but I, I unfortunately don't think they're coming soon enough, right? Um, it may take a more virulent pandemic to to change how we to change those those body engagement policies somewhat. I don't know. Right. Well, maybe we'll just have to see what happens. There's just yeah. too much going on at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, time has flown, Patrick. Um, thank you for sharing your your. Th- your history, um, your background, how you got into funeral services, the history of funeral services, and also what's going on and how things may change. Thank you for coming on and speaking. No, not at all. Thank you for having me, Yvonne. If you want to learn more about consulting archaeology and not that romanticized version from Indiana Jones, then consider picking up my book, Memoirs of a Reluctant Archaeologist, available in print, ebook, and audiobook, available at most booksellers. If you've learned something from this podcast, please forward it to your friends, family, or colleagues. And also consider leaving a rating or review so that I know what has helped you and how. 